Well, hello, 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 and welcome to our first video on parametric equations. Uh, today's video is going to be very basic and straightforward. Uh, we're not going to get into any of the calculus elements. We're not going to talk about slope of the curve or anything like that. Uh, we're just going to introduce you to them conceptually. We're going to practice graphing a few. We're going to practice converting a few of the equations back into rectangular form and, and vice versa. And, and then we're going to call it a day. So it's going to be a very nice intro day. And the first thing you'll notice as I've imported a few of these examples is that these weird looking graphs graphs now have arrows on them, um, which indicates the direction that the particle is traveling. And so the word direction is going to be a big key element here in this chapter. And I always want you to imagine that these equations represent the movement of some kind of particle on a two-dimensional plane, where that particle has options of going left, right, up, or down. And so uh, kind of like a bee buzzing through the air on a warm summer day is uh, what I always imagine. Um, but uh, what we have here on the first one on the left is that we've got a particle starting here at this point, and it's actually described as t equals negative 1, um, which is certainly okay to have negative time in this sense. It's, sometimes it's, it's, it's not an evil thing, it's not a bad thing. Basically, t equals 0 represents some starting point or reference point, and, and positive time represents anything in the future of that, and t equals negative 1 or negative anything would be you know past time or something that occurred before t equals 1. So... Um, then the particle kind of moves up and to the left, um, and then at t equals negative one half, it turns and it's now it's moving up and to the right, as you can see here. So we're describing the movement of some particle. Um, over here, we've got a particle that's traveling in this direction here. Again, it's not uh, these types of functions are not bounded by the concept of the vertical line test. That's an, a mute point. Um, another one, if you're interested in, in playing with your calculator a little bit, is we could change your calculator into parametric mode. We could graph these two interesting functions here. Notice you've got a very small x max and x mins, and same thing y mins and y maxes. And the only other thing you'll start to play with is your t min and t max and so forth. But kind of get this interesting creature, kind of reminds me of like a NASA logo or something of the sort. So, so I'd encourage you to play with your calculator a little bit and just kind of uh, watch your whistle with regards to how to graph a parametric function on your calculator. So this long um, definition kind of describes the key essence of a parametric equation and what makes it so valuable and useful. And here's the trick. It says not only do parametric equations describe the horizontal and vertical position of a particle. And if I stopped right there, I would be describing a rectangular equation. The rectangular equations are great at describing horizontal and vertical movements. But the parametric also describes the exact time that it took the particle to get to that position. So I want you to just imagine a basic projectile. Let's say we put a soccer ball right here in the origin and you ran up and you kicked it as hard as you could and it followed this type of a path. And as it's traveling through the air, um, our parametric equations are going to tell me, for instance, let's say we froze it at this moment right here at point A. So the parametric equation is going to tell us three valuable things about that particular point. Not only is he going to tell me the x-coordinate at that moment, or, and not only going to tell me the y-coordinate at that moment, but he's also going to describe the time that it took to reach that exact point right there. And every point on this graph it's going to have its own unique t value or time that it took to reach that point. Um, and so we've got that, we've got three variables in play here today. And that's where it's going to get real crazy. So um, generally, our notation is going to be, uh, they're going to define two equations to represent this curve. It would be x of t equals something, something. And then they would also define y of t is equaling something, something which uh, t is now the interesting one. That is your independent variable. Okay, and most importantly, we now call him the parameter. Okay, and hence the name parametric equations comes into play. But t is called the parameter, and that's the vocabulary we're going to try to discipline ourselves to use. And then x and y are now both dependent variables. Okay, normally it was just y before, but now they're both dependent variables. And basically all we're saying is that the value of x and the value of y depend on the value of t that we choose or substitute. 
So we're going to go ahead and jump into our first example, and they're asking us, uh, and we're going to use the same set of directions for all four of our examples to our notebook. But they're asking us to make a table of values and then sketch the curve, indicating the direction of your graph. That's going to be very important. And then we're going to practice eliminating the parameter. Now, eliminating the parameter is just another way of saying convert your equation from parametric into a rectangular, and that's all that last sentence really implies. Um, typically, they'll give you an interval of t values to make your graph, and for this one, I want to graph from negative 2 is less than or equal to t, which is less than or equal to 3. So that's the interval that I want to graph. The, the two equations, we're going to do x equals 2t minus 1. I could have said x of t equals 2t minus 1. And then we'll also graph y equals 1 minus t. So those are the equations that we want to work with. Now, as far as making a table of values, this is going to be rather, this is going to be a monster. We've got, um, we've got our t values up here, and then we've got our x values, and then we've got our y values. And we're going to start at negative 2 and try to squeeze in all the way to 3. And this is very basic. Um, this is kind of feels like third grade all over again. We're going to take negative 2 and we're going to substitute it into t right here. Um, and I got negative 5 for the x value. And I'm just going to do all my x values all at once. If I substitute a negative 1, I get negative 3. Substitute a 0 into that t value, I'm going to get negative 1. And then you kind of notice the pattern. They're going up by, by 2's. And hopefully we'll get a 5 here. Switch colors. For my y values, I'm going to take that negative 2, I'm going to substitute it into t, so 1 minus negative 2 is a 3, and then a 2, and then a 1, and then a 0, a negative 1, and a negative 2. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take all those individual um, ordered pairs, and we're going to try to plot them on a graph. So when t equals negative 2, I need to go left 5, up 3, and there's my very first point. That dot right represent, represents t equals negative 2. And then we're going to go negative 3, 2. And we've got negative 1, 1. And let's see. 1, 2, 3. 1, 0. 3, negative 1. And then 5, negative 2. So what we've got here is we've got a, a straight line that passed through those points. And we also want to indicate the direction. And I like to put a little arrow in between each set of points to show how I got from one point to the next. So uh, there's no, you know, can't use too many arrows. Arrows are a good thing because direction is very, very important. Uh, the only thing left to do now is to eliminate that parameter. And, and it's very simple. What, what I'd like to do, and there's very few exceptions to this, is I'm going to start with my x equation and what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for t so we've got x plus 1 equals 2t or x plus 1 all over 2 equals t and then I'm just going to substitute that expression into the other equation um, so we're going to say instead of one, y equals 1 minus t we could say y equals 1 minus x plus 1 over 2 For a second example today, I want to, let's try x equals the square root of t, y equals t plus 1, and let's do the interval from 0 to 9 uh, for t. However, <clears throat> we're going to cheat a little bit today, and within that interval 0 to 9, we're only going to pick out the perfect squares because x is defined as radical t and, and we're just going to keep things clean and, and friendly today. Um, notice, just to review, uh, t is called the parameter. He's known as the independent variable and then x and y are both dependent variables. And so for my big table of values here, I'm going to let t equal 0, I'm going to let t equal 1, I'm going to let t equal 4, and then we're going to skip all the way to 9. Like we said, we're just going to keep it friendly. Um, Go ahead, hit the pause button, see if you can fill in the table really quick, and then come back and compare. So here are the table of values I got. My x values were 0, 1, 2, and 3. My y values were 1, 2, 5, and 10. And now all we got to do is we got to take those rascals in and try to put them on some graph paper here. I got a little fancier this time because I thought my last graph was too messy. So I'm going to go ahead and we're plotting. Uh, the first point was 0, 1. And then we had 1, 2, and then we had 2, 5. And we'll see if we got just enough room to fit this last one on there. 3, 10. It's going to be up here. So all we're doing now is connecting those points. It's kind of a, you'll notice it's 
kind of starting to behave like a parabola. And if we throw our directional arrows on there, we're kind of moving in this direction like so. Last thing we want to now do is work on eliminating that parameter. We said uh, what we'd like to do is start with the x equation. We've got x equals radical t. We'll solve for t and then use our substitution method here. So y used to be uh, what t plus 1. So now we can say y is really x squared plus 1. And you'll notice if you kind of, this is a parabola that looks like this. And all we did is we kind of chopped off that left side because of the intervals of t we got. On our third example, I'm going to turn you loose here. We've got uh, our first equation, x equals t squared minus 2. We've got y defined as t divided by 2. And our interval is going to go from negative 2 all the way to 3. And we're not going to skip any values here this time, even though some of them result in fractions for y. And I want you to go ahead and construct your own table. Start plotting those points. Create your own graph with the direction indicated. And then come on back, hit the play button, and see if I've got the same thing. Okay, so hopefully your table of values looked a little bit like this, and now we're ready to plot them. And let's see, 2, negative 1, we're going to start down here, and then we've got negative 1, negative 1 half, negative 2, 0, negative 1, 1 half, we've got 2, 1, so I'll put me right there, and then 7, comma, and 3 and a half. So, Ooh, I think that's a big goof up there, so we'll go try to fix that. So here's what we've got. We've, we're swooping this way and then this way here. We'll throw in our directional to show that which way we're rotating and moving. Now, before we move on and eliminate that parameter, I just want to kind of give you a sneak peek of where we're heading over the next week or so. What, they, what the AP likes to do is they'll pick a specific point on that graph. They might pick this one right here, and they're gonna um, they're gonna ask you to describe dx dt. In other words, at what rate is x changing with respect to time? And what you notice is, at that particular point, <coughs> we're moving to the left, um, and the directional arrows indicate that we're going left and up. But you know, horizontally speaking, we're going to the left. And so, what we would do is we would say that x um, dx dt is actually negative because we're moving to the left, uh, the x value is decreasing or the horizontal position is decreasing as time elapses. At that same moment though, we could say that dy dt is actually positive because at that moment we're moving up, which means my y value or my vertical position is increasing at that specific moment. Now as far as eliminating that parameter goes, Let's go ahead, we'll start with our x equation. Well, typically we, we said we almost always start with our x equation. Here's an example where it's going to be much simpler and more convenient to start with your y equation. We'll solve that rascal, we'll get 2y equals t. And then we could substitute that into the x equation. So x used to be t squared minus 2. If we make that appropriate substitution, we'll get 4y squared minus 2. And that makes sense because in, you know, anytime we get an equation like this, we're expecting some kind of sideways parabola. Uh, this coefficient's positive, so we know it's opening to the right. And I think that does confirm the portion of the graph we have above just with a restricted interval. Our last one is the most interesting, as you could expect. We're now sprinkling in some trig functions, and they want the traditional interval 0 to 2 pi. Uh, we are going to make things quite easy, and we're going to just keep our intervals of um, our values of t very friendly. We're going to go 0, and then we're going to do pi over 2, then we'll do pi, and then we'll do 3 pi over 2, and we're going to do 2 pi. And what we're going to find out that using these values is specific enough to give us a good picture of what this graph's doing and how it's behaving. So go ahead, good time to hit the pause button, fill in that table, and come on back and see if you got the same thing I did. All right, so here's my x values. My x values were 5, uh, 3, 1, 3, and 5. And uh, let's see, I don't know why that slid over. My y values were negative 1, 2, negative 1, negative 4, negative 1. 
Now we're going to go ahead and graph these. So one of the nice things about this parametric is that you don't actually need to label your graph in terms of pi. We're just going to, we've got nice numbers now. We're going to start with 5, negative 1. Uh, then we've got 3, 2. We've got 1, negative 1. Let's see, we've got 3, negative 4. Push this down here. And then we're back to the beginning of 5, negative 1. And what we've created is a very nice circular pattern and I think we'll call it an ellipse it's not quite a smooth circle so we've got an ellipse on our hands here now remember we started right here so we're gonna push the arrows this way no such thing as too many arrows I uh, just want to make sure we've got enough as we go around so basically the key is our direction is counterclockwise here counterclockwise direction and eliminating the parameter and getting it into a rectangular mode this is a very interesting one and we're going to show you a really neat trick and the key to using this one is we're going to end up using the Pythagorean identity known as the godfather of sine squared plus cosine squared equals one but as far as that x equation goes all I want you to do is to try to get cosine of t by itself okay so we got three plus two cosine of t alright we're going to subtract the three over then we're going to divide by two and just get the cosine of t by itself and then on that y equation, we're going to do something similar. We're going to try to just get the sine of t by itself. We're going to, let's see, that was a negative one. So we're going to add the 1 over. we got y plus 1. The whole thing's divided by 3, and there's your sine of t. Now, recall, the godfather says that cosine squared, let's see, boy, my new pen's really struggling here, trying to give it a pep talk, uh, plus sine squared, is equal to 1. So as we make our appropriate substitutions here, we're going to say that entire quantity, and we got x minus 3 squared, and now it's divided by 4 because we squared the whole thing, and then we've got y plus 1 squared all over 9 now and that equals 1. And I don't know how much time you guys spent on um, elliptical equations back in Algebra 2, but this is the standard form of an ellipse. It has a center of positive 3 comma negative 1. It has a horizontal radius of 2, which would be the uh, square root of this denominator here. And then it has a vertical radius of 3, which is the square root of that rascal. So it does match our graph perfectly. It's not quite a circle. It's a very nice ellipse. And so there's a neat trick on how we take advantage of the godfather to convert a parametric into a rectangular mode. So hopefully these four examples uh, went well, and we'll see you tomorrow in class. And we got the right side of that parabola.